Hello everyone. Let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about the acellular microbes, the viruses, and the prions. This is obviously a very timely topic right now as we are in the middle of a pandemic involving a virus, a new virus called SARS-CoV-2. And this virus causes a disease called COVID-19. We are in the middle of this pandemic right now around the entire world. It has not spared us here in the United States. We'll spend most of our time today talking about viruses. And we'll talk just a little bit about the prions at the end of the lecture. So what exactly is a virus? By definition, a virus is an obligate intracellular parasite. Intra, remember, means within. So this is a thing that must be inside of a cell, obligate, intracellular, in order to be a parasite. That term parasite means something. It describes a symbiosis, so a relationship between two things, and one of those things benefits while the other is harmed by that relationship. The virus is going to benefit. The cell is going to be harmed. Obligate intracellular parasite composed of nucleic acid, and remember there are two kinds of nucleic acid, DNA and RNA, and protein that cannot replicate itself or perform metabolic reactions. So, viruses contain genetic material, but unlike living cells, that genetic material can be either of the nucleic acids, DNA or RNA. Remember, cells on planet Earth all use DNA as their genetic material. In the virus, this genetic material is surrounded by a coat of protein. And we give that coat a name. We call it a capsid. The other term that you will see in certain reference materials is nucleocapsid. That term just refers to the entire virus. The genetic material and the capsid together are called a nucleocapsid. Here's the thing about viruses that many people do not understand. Viruses are not cells. Remember the things that we have discussed that make a cell a cell. All of the things that every cell on planet Earth has, all of the things that they share between themselves. Every cell has a membrane. Viruses do not have a membrane. Every cell has cytoplasm. Viruses do not have cytoplasm. Every cell has ribosomes. Viruses do not have ribosomes. Viruses also don't have any organelles, which eukaryotic cells do. In fact, the only thing that viruses have, that living cells have, are some type of nucleic acid and protein. So, we're going to call the genetic material just that when we talk about viruses, because it can be one of two different types. And you'll hear me talk about the capsid. You'll also hear me sometimes use the term virion. A virion is just another term that we use to describe a virus when it is outside of a living cell. The extracellular form of a virus, in other words. You'll also hear me call viruses particles, and that's because they are not cells. 
viruses are not cellular and therefore viruses are not technically alive. Now this is a very strange concept to wrap your head around because we think about viruses oftentimes the way we think about bacteria. Remember, bacteria and viruses are the two most commonly encountered pathogens in humans and other animals. So it makes sense that we tend to think of them in similar ways. But in reality, they couldn't be any more different. Viral particles are not alive by any of the definitions of life. They have no ability to replicate themselves. They have no ability to do anything metabolic. They can't build molecules. They can't break down molecules. They can't consume nutrients. They can't excrete waste. They also have no ability to take in information about their environment or to integrate that information and respond to it the way a living cell does. What viruses do is gain entry into a host cell. When you hear me use the term host, I'm referring to the cell that a viral particle gains entry into. Remember, they are obligate intracellular parasites. The enzymes and the cellular machinery inside of that host cell are going to perform the things that the viral particle can't perform for itself. The host cell is going to copy or replicate the genetic material of the virus. The host cell is going to decode the information in the genetic material in the processes called transcription and translation. The host cell is going to synthesize viral proteins. The host cell, in other words, is going to make more viral particles. You've seen this diagram before. This is a, a picture that we looked at that depicts the three domains of living things on planet Earth. And remember, we referred to this as a phylogenetic tree, or sometimes the tree of life. It shows the bacteria in blue, the archaea in red, and the eukaryota in brown, sometimes called eukarya. Those two terms mean the same thing. We talked about how the base of this phylogenetic tree represents this universal common ancestor, the very first form of life that appeared on planet Earth, and how as we travel up the trunk of the tree, we hit this branching point, this node, where some of the organisms went off on their own evolutionary path to become bacteria. The rest of the organisms took a different path. And as they encountered the world around them and tried to survive in varying environments, the next group that branched off in evolution were the archaea, and then finally the eukarya. You'll notice that viruses aren't on the tree of life. Viruses don't belong in the bacterial domain or the archaeal domain or the eukaryotic domain. They don't belong in any domain because they're not alive. That doesn't mean, though, that we can't do what we would call a phylogenetic analysis of viruses. We do that all the time. And in fact, we build phylogenies or evolutionary histories for viruses all the time. We can do that because they contain genetic material. We can look at the sequence of the bases inside the genetic material of a viral particle, and we can compare that sequence with other viral particles. And we can see what, which particles share sequence and how that sequence has changed over time. If you take a look at this slide, you're looking at a phylogenetic tree. You're looking at um, 
a portion of the evolutionary history of viruses. It's only a small group of viruses, but um, this is what I mean when I say that you can do a phylogenetic analysis for viruses. Now this tree doesn't look like the tree we've seen in the past. It's turned on its side. So the branches are all heading off to the right instead of going up. You'll also notice that the universal common ancestor is not depicted on this tree. Instead, we have an ancestral virus called Anidovirales. This is actually an order, a viral order. Remember, order in taxonomy refers to a large collection of organisms. The Nidovirales is, on this diagram, the most recent common ancestor. So in other words, all of the organisms to the right of this, this group, they are all related to each other evolutionarily. They all descended from this particular group of viruses. You can see that the first branching pattern shows us the families that we can describe within this larger group. And if you notice, at the bottom, you can see Corona viridae. Corona viridae is the family of viruses that gave, um, that introduced the coronavirus subfamily. Corona viridae actually split into the Corona virinae and the Toro virinae. So two subfamilies are in this larger family of viruses. And then if you follow the Corona virinae, you can see it also has evolved to split into four different what are called genuses. These are technically not genuses by definition, but that's okay. <laughs> We're going to refer to them or think of them as genuses, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma coronavirus. Now, if you look at the beta coronavirus, you see that that has given rise to three specific viruses. SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2. It's the SARS-CoV-2 virus that is currently at pandemic levels around the globe. Now, one thing to remember about these kinds of trees, this is a work in progress. When you look at a phylogenetic tree like this, this is not the end of the story. This is the story as far as we know it, number one, and as far as it's gone today. So if you came back to this tree a thousand years from now, and it had been updated, you would see much more branching over here. So this is our most current understanding of where the SARS-CoV virus came from. If you're not familiar, SARS stands for something. It's Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And the first of these beta coronaviruses to emerge uh, was SARS-CoV. That was back in 2003-2004. There was an epidemic of SARS-CoV when it was a brand new virus in both Asia and also in Canada. A few years later, in 2012, MERS-CoV emerged. MERS stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And of course, the CoV just means coronavirus. Um, that also hit epidemic proportions in the Middle East. And now, of course, we have SARS-CoV-2, which is, again, severe, acute, respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. I want to spend just a minute and talk about the central dogma of biology. Some of you may already know this material. But just to make sure that we're all on the same page as we move forward today using certain terminology, I want to review it for us. We describe the central dogma 
of biology as our understanding of how information flows in a cell. And our dogma consists of three statements, and I have them listed below. When we call something a dogma, it's something that we all believe. It's something that is our foundation in terms of our science. Now, when I say how information flows, what I'm talking about is how the blueprint in the DNA of basically how to make an organism is then taken to the final product, if you will, which is all of the proteins that combine to create that organism. So when I refer to how information flows, I'm, me I'm referring to the flow from the DNA molecule, which has code in it, to the messenger RNA molecule, which has code in it, to the protein molecule, which is that product. Now, sometimes I have students say to me, how come the dogma only talks about protein? How come the dogma doesn't talk about the other macromolecules? Remember, there are four. There's protein, carbohydrate, lipid, and nucleic acid. So how come we only talk about the protein as being part of the dogma? The answer is because enzymes are made out of protein. And it's enzymes inside a living cell that give rise to or allow chemical reactions to give rise to all the other macromolecules. So indeed, it is protein, particularly enzymes, that allow a living cell to be a living cell, to give it all of its characteristics or its traits. So the first statement of the dogma says, DNA is used to make RNA in a process called transcription. RNA is then used to make protein in a process called translation, and proteins create traits, physical traits, physiological traits, anatomical traits, behavioral traits, everything that makes that organism unique. I said a few minutes ago that genetic material is nucleic acid. It's one of the four macromolecules and that there are two types of nucleic acid. There is DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And there is RNA, which stands for ribonucleic acid. Both DNA and RNA have what we call bases in them, what would technically be called a nucleotide. Some of the same bases appear in DNA and RNA, but there's a slight difference. In DNA, the bases are A, T, G, and C. In RNA, there is no T, there is no thymine. Instead, it's replaced with a molecule called uracil, which we indicate with the uppercase letter U. So in RNA, we find the bases A, U, G, and C. In both forms of nucleic acid, both DNA and RNA, we can find mutations. Now, all that word mutation means is a change in the order of the bases. So if the bases start out in a particular sequence or a particular order, things can happen that will change the order of those bases. And if those changes become permanent, we end up with a mutation. When mutations are created, they can sometimes create new traits for an organism which is the basis of evolutionary change. As I'm sure you are aware, some mutations are problematic for the organism and can cause disease and even death. Many mutations are created when nucleic acid gets replicated or copied. 
Remember, every time a cell divides, it has to copy its DNA. It has to make a copy so that each of the two brand new cells that come after the division, each one of those gets its own copy of the DNA molecule. The process of copying DNA or replicating DNA is achieved with an enzyme. And that enzyme sometimes makes mistakes. It puts the wrong base in. So the more a cell divides, especially the more rapidly a cell divides, the more the opportunity exists for mutations to occur. Now, luckily for us, there are systems in cells that catch these mistakes, catch these before they become permanent mutations. But some mutations persist, some mutations stay. Now, why am I mentioning all of this? Viruses have genetic material in them. Viral genetic material also gets copied. The virus doesn't copy it, the host cell does. But the more a virus gets copied, the more the opportunity exists for mutations to occur. And unlike cells, viral particles don't have the necessary equipment, if you will, to catch and repair mutations. So viruses mutate more frequently than cells do. The virus that has brought the world to its knees right now, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is a mutated form of another virus. When we get some mutations in viruses, it gives the virus new traits that make that virus more dangerous to us. And such is the case with SARS-CoV-2. Remember, G DNA is the genetic material of living things. DNA exists as a double-stranded molecule in living cells. You all know that. It exists as what we call a double helix, two strands of DNA, where the bases on each strand are drawn together, attracted to each other in a complementary way. A's are attracted to the T's and bond together. G's are attracted to C's, they bond together. And this double helix of DNA is created. Viruses use both DNA and RNA in their genetic material. And when we look at that DNA or RNA, depending on the virus, we see some very unusual things. DNA in a viral particle can be double-stranded, or it can be single-stranded. You don't find that in a living cell. RNA can be single-stranded, the way we usually find it, or it can be double-stranded. We see all different kinds of permutations of genetic material inside viral particles.